inspired actually by President Millet, Javier Millet of Argentina, who was very touched by my book in Spanish. So it inspired me, you know what? Perhaps it can inspire and strengthen and give and empower the soldiers, the military, the IDF. So we printed a special 50,000 print edition, special edition in honor of the Tzahal, which is the IDF, the Sabah Haganah the Israel, Israel Defense Forces, and to be distributed single-handedly, personally, to each of 50,000 soldiers. So actually, the distributed, the printing happened, the distribution is almost done. So one of the people who borrowed in the distribution said to me, you know, tonight we're having an event, and I'm going to be giving out books, and there's going to be a barbecue. So I said, maybe you can come over. They said, how far is it? Probably an hour and a half drive. It ended up being a two and a half hour drive with traffic. It was down south, minutes away, literally from the Gaza border. As a matter of fact, when you drive there, you see Rafa crossing. We know Rafa's in the news. That's the last stronghold of Hamas. With all the controversy about Israel entering there, etc. So this is literally minutes away from there. And there's a training camp. A place called Sa'alim. Sa'alim. A training camp. Military base. It was an und- indescribable the experience meeting hundreds, hundreds of military, young men and women, 20 years old, 21 years old, young, and you should see their faces, alive, joyful, unified, vigilant, determined. When you go there, you don't feel what you hear in the news, especially in the United States, from campuses or from politicians. You see a unified young people ready to protect and defend innocent men, women, and children of Israel. And tomorrow, who knows? I don't even want to mention. They're all prepared to go into Gaza when called upon. And who knows what will happen? Again, that there'll be miracles, that it be natural, that they should all be protected. And that's definitely our prayers and our wishes and so on. But they're ready. They were coming to me to sign the books looking for inspiration. And the truth is, as I told them, I shared a few words. We posted it. If you want to see it, you can easily have access it at TamiriFalife.com. We have it on our YouTube channel. I spoke in Hebrew, but we have it with subtitles. And I said, I stand humbled and in awe, embarrassed actually before you, because you are the true heroes. People ready to, there's nothing greater than sacrifice in your life to protect others. So the inspiration that, that that brought forth was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Again, I have no words. But there again I saw a miracle. Because here people, you think, would be terrified, cowering in fear. What's going to happen? And instead there's this attitude, complete, you know, the word procrastination, laziness, delay. All those features of Western easy life, the comfort zone life doesn't exist there. It's a sense of urgency, mission. So as much as I feel I'm on a calling and a mission, it was completely at a different level when I see and saw this. So the inspiration of sensing, we too are in battle. Some of us it's physical battle, some of us it's psychological, some of it's spiritual. And an offensive battle, I mean. Not just defending against enemies, which of course is necessary. So a renewed sense of urgency. Lesson number two. The sense of urgency, sense of mission, sense of calling. We all wish that calling would be only for bringing light to the world. And that's the ultimate goal. But sometimes you have to deal with some of the darkness, the enemies around. I was taken for a tour right there in that same area. They built a thing called Little Gaza. It's a replica of Gaza. Over 600 buildings with tunnels, everything. Everything. So the military can train in real time what, is, what, what they're going to be facing. You go into the tunnels, it's terrifying. Dark, cramped, claustrophobic, nowhere to go. It's a whole different mindset. So you get a little, little taste. Not the real thing, obviously. And again, bringing out the need for that urgency, sense of mission. We're on a mission. I felt I was one with them. It's not like they're fighting the battle and I'm sitting in my, in my comfortable cafe or hotel, even though that is technically correct. But 
you feel an re- obligation, responsibility. You come back to the United States. I have my mission to speak to you, to teach, to write, to share together, to join together in fighting the spiritual war, as we've been talking about over the last months. But it's renewed with a renewed vigor, knowing that you have partners that are actually fighting, and I'm not even comparing our war to their war, but it's not separate. We're all part of one larger organism. And when one part of the organism is hurting, the rest is hurting. And one part, or one organism, part of the organism is strong, the rest is strong. Among other aspects that I saw there, and there's always, wherever you dig, wherever you look, you find all kinds of experiences, was the diversity. The diversity from the ultra, what they call the ultra Haredim, the right-wing, ultra-Orthodox Jewish sector, to the other extreme, the secular, the Chilonim. I mean, a diversity exists everywhere in the world, but for some reason, maybe because it's close to home, it seems to jump out at me, especially in the Jewish people, because we all come from the same roots, but yet it branches off to extremes, and everything in between and over and under. So on one hand, that can lead to, of course, tragically, to divisiveness, to conflict, as we unfortunately have seen. But it also teaches us something critical about humanity and about our relationship with God and our higher calling. Life is not meant to be vanilla, one color, one musical note. It was from the outset meant to be diverse because true beauty can only be found in diversity, the harmony within diversity. As beautiful as the color blue may be, or color red, or green, or whatever your favorite color is, as beautiful as one musical note may be, if you just play the same note, the same color, it will become monotonous. You can't call it beautiful. You can say it's nice, but then... However, different musical notes with different tones and different tempos, same thing with different colors and different hues and different shades, you combine that in the right order, it creates what we call the harmony of within diversity, true beauty. A beautiful face is not just a beautiful nose or eyes or complexion or cheeks or lips or forehead. It's some type of confluence that's almost impossible really to capture, a synergy that does things, a certain synchronicity of many different elements put in the right order. If you put them in the wrong order, it creates chaos. And it can be very, actually, disturbing, unnerving. Try to play music backwards or in the wrong order. Or take the same colors in a beautiful masterpiece painting and reorganize them in a a disorganized way. But when it's in the right place, it becomes, they all melt together, dissolve into one larger picture. Like a, good, like a well-written article or a well-written book. Many chapters, many words, but it just flows and you feel it. You feel that harmony. You feel that seamlessness. So as I was walking the streets and visiting and meeting people and different experiences, I saw that very, very vividly. And perhaps because it's a smaller country and because it's called Israel and because everyone, at least, I mean, there are, of course, the Arabs and the Jews, and other cultures, but I was primarily in the Jewish areas, that when you see that, you get a certain appreciation of the harmony within diversity. Can there lead to conflict? Yes, unfortunately it has as well. But that's our job, is to make sure it leads to harmony. And I have to be honest with you, one day I was walking from Mamila, which is not far from the wall, Mamila Hotel, I was meeting some people, I was walking back, to, to, to a central, a more central part of Jerusalem, Geula. And I was walking along the wall of the old city. And I did walk through Arab neighborhood. I saw it from the language. So that only added to that diversity. My hope was as I was walking through there, and I think about it now, can we find that same harmony, even with those that have, with many who have sworn our destruction, or sworn to our destruction? I personally believe that will happen in our lifetime. But we have to be people who are agents of that. Because you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. And if you're not, as they say, busy living, you're busy dying. So you and I have to deliberately and proactively declare war against divisiveness, against conflict, 
Now, I'm not naive. I understand there are people ready to kill you. You know, you can't just say, hey, let's just be, let's live in harmony. You have to do what you have to do. But I don't believe that the majority are that way. Even though the majority may be sympathetic, when I say majority of Muslims may be sympathetic, but I do believe that the more light we hold on to and the more we com- capture that mission, that urgency that we need, and more we recognize the miracles around us and we manifest them, we influence those around us, that has an exponential effect. And I take my lesson from the great Abraham. He, I don't like the word preached, but he pioneered monotheism, virtue, that life is not about the id and about selfish needs and self-interest. Life is about serving, about chesed, mishpat, charity, virtue, kindness, justice, all the rights, all the freedoms, all the blessings we cherish today. Abraham pioneered. At the time, he was opposed by the entire world. They saw him as a threat, an upstart, a rebel, wanted to kill him, like all pioneers. But he was persistent, him and his wife Sarah, and they built a family, Isaac. And Isaac built and had children, and those children had children. And here we are, thousands of years later, almost we're talking about 3,800 years later. So no one's going to tell me. No one should tell us it's not possible. It's absolutely possible. It happened already. So we need to keep marching in that direction, the march of progress, of taking the mandate of Abraham and teaching it to all his children. Abraham is called the father of all nations because he has a son called Yishmael, who's the ancestor, the forebearer of the Arab Muslim world. He had a son called Isaac, who had a son called Jacob, the forebearer and ancestor of the Jewish people. And Isaac had also another son, Esau, the ancestor and forebearer of the Western Roman Christian world. His grandson was called Roimi, Rome. All children of Abraham. You'll say, what about the Far East? Well, you know, you ever hear of Brahmin in the Buddhism? Brahmin's connected to Abraham as well. Abraham sent some of his family to the East as the Bible tells us in Genesis. So it's not about taking credit, it's about understanding that we all share common ancestry, all the way back to Adam and Eve. And yes, we've branched off in many different directions, but branching off can lead to divisiveness, war and conflict, or it can lead to harmony, as we've been discussing. That's the call of the hour. And that's what I go away with, coming from Israel, feeling exactly that. What can we do to bring us all together? So you begin, of course, with the low-hanging fruit, the people in your sphere of influence, the people that you can access. You don't start fighting with people who are just closed-minded and just haters. But slowly, slowly, like it is in any situation, divide and conquer. When you have, let's say, tangled wires, you can't untangle them all. You untangle the easier tangles. And then you isolate and contain the more difficult ones. But it'll be a lot easier then. The mess is when everything goes one big confusion, confusing mess. So we have to provide clarity, strength, direction, guidance, empowerment, confidence. And we have what to stand on. Years of history. You go to Israel, you can draw from there. Draw that energy from the gate to heaven. The interface between heaven and earth. May we all be blessed to marry heaven and earth. Now, my book, Toward a Meaningful Life, one of the chapters, I believe, on unity, I write at the end of the chapter. So where does heaven meet earth? People always wonder. The answer is at your doorstep, in your life. When you can bring together matter and spirit, body and soul, form and function, the indeterministic and the deterministic, you are marrying heaven and earth. Israel has that power, but it's up to us because the final frontier is our choices. And now we have a time, now is a time when we can rise to the occasion because there is a wake up call. The conflicts are all there, the paradoxes abound, the miracles are there, but it's up to us to draw from it, learn our lessons, not be complacent, fight an aggressive war of offense. What's the war of offense? To bring light into this dark world, to bring clarity, moral clarity, 
spiritual clarity, psychological clarity, which is the essence of all health, a seamless flow of the divine purpose and our purpose, where they're aligned that we are living our lives and fulfilling our calling with a sense of urgency and mission. May all the people in Israel and in all the countries, the Muslim countries, the Arab countries, all over the world be at peace, discover their calling, discover the harmony within our diversity. May God protect the soldiers, all innocent people, especially in that special land of providence called the Promised Land. Thank you so much. This has been Simon Jacobson. Meaning for Life Center, MeaningfulLife.com is our website. Please subscribe to our offerings, to our growing and robust YouTube channel. Love to hear your thoughts, comments, feedback, and of course, share. Please share. It's about the ripple effect, the butterfly effect. Thank you and be well. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com slash donate.